The Soul Redeemer, Book 3, Chapter 9, Up into the Heavenlies. Nicole found herself back in her living room, sprawled out on the floor. Had she been dreaming? No, it was more than that. She had been in the heavenlies, and she was being called to action to go after the children. But what did that mean? She had been given the spiritual blessing of a spiritual war horse. But what did that mean? She had just gotten Jake off to work when the phone rang. Hey, girl, Casey's voice greeted. I think we need to meet all together. We've got a lot to talk about. Nicole arrived at the inn before the others, and while she was starting the coffee pot, someone entered the front door. A man was standing in the entry with a baby. He held her out to Nicole. Please, miss, I heard that you can help to cast demons out of people. My little daughter is possessed. Please help us, the distraught father pleaded. What makes you think she's possessed, Nicole asked as she looked at the baby. She's only five months old and she walks on her own. Strange things have been happening since she was born, he answered. Nicole looked into the baby's eyes. They began to bulge and her face became distorted. Compassion for the little one struck her heart, and since she had the father's permission, she took the baby in her arms, began to bind the demons, and command them to go in Jesus' name. The baby began to burp, and then it coughed. Nicole didn't see the demons leave, but she felt them go. The baby's face and eyes returned to normal, and Nicole prayed over her before returning her to her daddy. Holding on to her, he had just set her feet down on the floor and smiled when she pulled them up under her instead of walking. Thank you so much for your help, he said. I have some demonic issues as well. Would you be able to help me? Nicole replied, Not at this time. We would need to go through a process with you. But here's an information packet you can fill out and bring back. He thanked her again and left. Not five minutes later, Nicole was struck with debilitating pain in her back for no reason. Lord Jesus, help me. What's going on? She cried out. Nicole, did you seek me before casting the demons out of that baby? No, Lord, I didn't, she said. You acted in compassion that was not my heart. The Father was sent to trick you into opening a door so that a curse could attach to you. Had you helped the man, the curses would have been exponentially powerful. Oh, Father, I am so sorry. I assumed that you would want me to help a helpless baby. After all, you told me to go after the children. But I failed so miserably just after such an amazing encounter with you, Nicole said as she bowed her head before her father. I ask your forgiveness for not following the set procedures that I know are a safeguard and for trusting in my own understanding and for not seeking you. I renounce the curse that is causing pain and I ask for your cleansing blood to wash the stain of it from me in spirit, soul, and body. I command all evil spirits to leave me and go to the feet of Jesus. Immediately the pain lifted and Jesus took her hand and helped her to her feet. My heart is full of compassion for people, Nicole. But never assume that I have a compassionate heart for those sold out to evil. My heart longs for the day when I reveal myself to this little one who will then be able to choose for herself whom she will serve. But until then, she is under the dominion of the evil one. With her mind spinning from the lesson she hoped she would remember, and never repeat. She welcomed the other intercessors who soon arrived. Liz came running in a little late, breathless with excitement. The rock house fell into a sinkhole! Deanne smiled. I was going to tell everybody when you got here, but I see that news travels fast. Nicole exclaimed. Then it's real! I heard the stallions and thought they were trampling the enemy under their feet. Deanne agreed. The sad part is, is that two people were in the house and are now dead. I was hoping they would come to Christ like Zira did. Casey said, There was a lot going on last night. She went on to explain what had taken place at her house. 
The thing that affected me most was the hopelessness of the darkness. It has given me greater compassion for those who are lost, who don't have the light of life. Liz said, I think what would have affected me the most is that chim chimera. Ooh, she said with a body shiver. Mary said, this does bring up an important issue. Compassion for the lost is a tremendous burden. But what constitutes the lost? At what point is a human no longer redeemable? At what point does any physical being become unredeemable? This question is significant because we must know when to have compassion and when to have our minds set as flint against a compassionate heart for creatures that the Lord hates and has devoted for destruction. Deanne spoke up. Good point. I'm thinking about the clones. It was the same question we had to consider with Megan. Nicole agreed. Joel told me that until we know if clones had a redeemable spirit or not, that we should assume that they did and treat them as non-believers, not as non-humans. We learned that even though bloodlines had been corrupted because Megan, Robert, and Risa exercised their will and chose Jesus, the power of his redeeming love and holy blood thoroughly cleansed them from all defilement, and their spirits were made alive in Christ. Mary sighed deeply. There are many things we cannot know apart from the discernment of the Holy Spirit, but I am deeply troubled. I believe that things have progressed since the creation of the clones we know. I'm not sure that the creatures we are dealing with now have a soul. This corruption reminds me of the corruption that motivated the Lord to destroy all flesh on the earth with a flood. All flesh, except for Noah's bloodline, had been inbred with fallen angel seed. This corruption had also affected even the animal and plant life. I don't doubt the power of Jesus' blood for cleansing, but talking about the cleansing of total defilement makes me very uncomfortable. God's word's very clear in Leviticus 19.19 19 when it says, You shall not let your livestock breed with a different kind. It even speaks against sowing a field with mixed seed. Nicole said, I understand, Mary, and we take your warning very seriously. We are not in support of cloning or chimera or transhumanism, nor are we defending or condoning it. No, we're not, Casey joined in, and we do not want to undermine or pervert the pure gospel of God's word. But I think that these issues need to be well thought out and covered in prayer. I don't think we should assume that all flesh is unredeemable just because it is genetically defiled. I'm just thinking that we need to take the resurrection power of Jesus' blood into account as we step into this new era and watch for those with a truly repentant heart. We were all born into corruption, Nicole said, and we were all dead in our trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2, 4 through 10 says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together and made us sit in the, together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. There are a lot of keys in this passage, Casey said. Question. Are clones, chimera, and transhumans the workmanship of God, created in Christ Jesus for good works? Nicole answered, no, I'd say that they were definitely not created in the image of God. They were created by people with evil intentions for them who designed and programmed them to carry out the works of darkness. As they were prone to do, their banter picked up speed as they began thinking out loud. Does this scripture apply to those who are not created in God's image, Casey questioned? I guess that would depend on if they have the ability to choose Christ or not, Nicole said. Good thought, Casey answered. We need to consider Mary's comment and ask whether or not these beings have a soul and a spirit. Nicole said animals have souls. 
They have personalities, minds that can think, wills to choose, and emotions to feel. But they don't have a spirit that can be awakened by the quickening of the Holy Spirit. Casey asked, so are these humanly designed creatures bodies without souls or spirits? Without a soul, they don't have free will to choose God. And without a spirit, they cannot have faith, which is necessary for redemption. Nicole asked, are humans the only species with spirits? And if these others have some human DNA, even if they have a soul, do they have a spirit? If so, is it inherently evil, dead to God and alive only to Satan without hope of relationship with God? Is it beyond redemption? Wait a minute here, Liz said as she held up her hand and closed her eyes in contemplation. You guys are making my head spin. When does God's kingdom ever function under formulas? Casey and Nicole looked at each other and began to smile. Never, they both proclaimed simultaneously. Mary seemed a little relieved. That's true, she said. There are no formulas in God's kingdom, but there are conditions in his kingdom that always begin with a repentant heart, one willing to surrender to the Holy Spirit, to live according to the instructions written in his word so that his promises can be fulfilled. And only God knows the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Well, that's it then, Deanne said. I think that the only way we will be able to know what God's heart, mind, and plans are in any given circumstance is from our seat in the heavenlies in Christ. Casey stood and picked up her shofar. You are so right, girl. Enough talk. We need to enter into the heavenlies and pray. The ladies all stood in surrender while the shofar sent forth a salute of love, worship, and service. The Prince of Peace himself descended upon the hearts of these watchmen warriors and his Holy Spirit through his mantle of intercession over them as they humbly and boldly entered into the habitation of the Most High God. Nicole was exhausted, not just from physical labor, but from all the thinking and praying. She fell asleep as soon as her head hit the pillow that night. She dreamed of heavenly power propelling them forward, and though this was war, they were mounted on their stallions with wings like eagles that would run and not grow weary. Suddenly, a dream worse than any nightmare she had ever known slammed into her conscious dream state. The vivid visuals and the horrifying emotions refused to relent even after she awoke. It had been a dream. But she was afraid that reality was woven throughout it. She was terrified beyond measure, not only for what she had seen, but because of what she feared she either had done or would do.